Okay, I guess we could. <clears throat> okay, welcome again. Um, I'm ready to start uh, with this uh, final lecture today, and uh, thank you again for for joining us today. Um, maybe I should just pause for a minute or two if you have any questions, or so from yesterday's lecture or from, uh, you know, without which you feel I could not continue. Otherwise, I will start immediately. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, it's given me great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Fazlur Rahman Malik, that is his full name, but he's often just known as Fazlur Rahman. So there is a huge gap between Rumi and the 20th century intellectual Fazlur Rahman, whom I am introducing today. After celebrating the signs with Rumi in the, in the 13th century yesterday, I was tempted to pause on the brilliant theoretical analysis of history of Ibn Khaldun, who lived from 1332 to 1406 in the 14th century, and perhaps some others that have come in you know, since then as well. But I wanted to, in this last lecture, to whet your appetite with a lecture on a, on a scholar who has made a significant contribution to how Muslim intellectuals and progressives think about Islam in the 20th century. He also exemplifies the link between the two uh, discourses that I have been balancing in my lectures. The modern Western that, applies its, that has applied itself to this intellectual tradition and the pre-modern Islamic discourse that we saw these intellectuals engage each other with, either directly or indirectly. So I will also try to show how Fazlur Rahman continued an Islamic discourse whilst drawing on new ideas from the humanities and the social, social sciences. So I think I could have chosen other, somebody else, but in a way, his uh, firmly based in the 20th century represents a very good example. I hope that you will agree with me by the end of this lecture. So prior to the 19th century, scholars so deeply immersed in the intellectual tradition, uh, scholars that I looked at in the 18th century were still deeply, impre uh, uh, deeply immersed in the intellectual tradition which I have presented to you. But with a great Western transformation, as, as Marshall Hodgson, who is a famous scholar of Islam, calls it, the world established by Muslims, which included these intellectual traditions, were decentered, modified, or, or outright destroyed. Modernity or modernization, I think, is a euphemism for the reorganization of the world to the political, intellectual, and social norms of our social norms and values emanating from the West and from, from Europe. Sometimes I think one has to be cautious about using modernization because it hides this destructive element that has come along with it. And certainly one can see it in the Islamic intellectual tradition as elsewhere. On the political front, the impact of this change was felt indirectly in the, in the 18th century. By this time, European powers had already encircled Muslim from West Africa to Indonesia. As political dynasties weakened in this stranglehold, movements of revival emerged. So the jihad movements in West Africa and the Wahhabi reformers in the Arabian Peninsula were the first of successful political and religious attacks against existing Muslim establishments and governments, and which included their, at that time, existing intellectual traditions. As the centers became weaker, these new movements seized the opportunity to establish what Ibn Khaldun would have called a more virile, more virile upstarts in the periphery. So if you look at Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabi kingdom started in the, what is now known as Riyadh, right in the middle of the desert, challenging the existing establishment that was more based on the uh, eastern side, which was in Mecca and Medina. Where previously such movements might have led to the founding of empires, like the Fatimids, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals, these movements were lo localized and limited by the more powerful forces of European empires who soon crushed them or domesticated them to the new order. 
But in the second half of the, 20th, in the, of the 19th century, most Muslims, or at least many Muslims, I should say, realized that resistance to European colonial control was actually futile. Different approaches were henceforth adopted. John Vall, who has, attempt, who has attempted to categorize these responses, divided them into uh, uh, styles of action. He calls them the adaptationists, the conservatives, the fundamentalists, and the personal pietists. This Weberian analysis might sound useful to us because they sound like the kind of categories that we work with, but it puts emphasis on the reaction of Muslims. It limits our ability to see the creativity of Muslim responses and their links to the past. So with Fazl Rahman, I would like to focus on the stream of Muslim intellectuals who might be called adaptationists or modernizers, but who emerged, who emerged in this new world but who recognize the intellectual and political challenges posed to Muslims from the West. At the same time, they were also the inheritors of a tradition that I have presented to you in the last few days. So Fazl Rahman uh, was born in 1919 and he died in 1988. He was born in, in what, is, what was then India in the Northwest province and studied Islam first with his father, Maulana Shihabuddin, who was a graduate of a Deoband college. The first of such Deobandi colleges in India was, were founded in 1866 after the complete colonization of India, aiming to preserve the religious sciences of the, of the past. In the Deobandi colleges, this meant a focus on jurisprudence and to some extent also on mysticism. With this background, Rahman stepped into another world when he went to study Arabic at the Punjab University in Lahore. That university was founded by the British in 1854. He later had an opportunity to continue his uh, studies at Oxford University where he obtained a doctoral degree. Rahman knew Arabic, Persian, and English before he arrived in Oxford, obviously Urdu as well. There, while there, he also learned classical Greek, Latin, French, and German in a very short time. For his PhD dissertation, Rahman produced an annotated translation and a commentary on Ibn Sina's book of Kitab al-Najat, the book of salvation. Rahman taught at Durham and McGill in England and Canada respectively until 1961, when he was invited to return to Pakistan. Uh, from 1963 to 1968, he served as a director of the Central Institute for Islamic Research and also took a seat on a government body called the Islamic Ideology Council. General Ayub Khan at the time permitted him to gather some of the leading Muslim intellectuals to make some policy recommendations for this post-colonial state of Pakistan. Rahman and his colleagues reflected on the major issues facing the state, but also engaged in public debates on immediate issues that the state wanted to introduce, like the permissibility of interest, uh, the uh, issue of mechanical slaughter, and family planning, all sort of famous modern issues, if one can recognize them. In each case, Rahman found that the issue became embroiled in political rivalry among groups who tried to make a claim on public life in Pakistan. He believed that there was, in, the, in these debates, there was more politics than, and there was hardly, and I quote him, with hardly any, there was hardly any Islamic content. Rah Rahman was hardly equipped to deal with these public debates. When uh, Naqvi writes, wrote, wrote an obituary of his, he related this interesting story about him and his relationship with the field marshal Ayub Khan. Naqvi says that the field marshal Ayub Khan, in the later days of his regime, asked, asked Dr. Fazlur Rahman to write a book on the ideology of Islam. Dr. Fazlur Rahman completed the first chapter of the book and with the hope of winning laurels from his patron, he took the chapter to the field marshal. The field marshal cast a cursory glance over a few pages of the book and forwarded it to Mr. Altaf Johar, his chief advisor in such matters, saying, Altaf, could you please translate this into English? So what is significant is not only that Rahman wrote in a difficult style, of, uh, style accessible to ordinary people, but I found it also interesting and it's noteworthy to say that this whole conversation was concerned about producing something in accessible English in the 1960s.
1968, when a field marshal lost his position or lost his authority in the political turmoil of Pakistan, due particularly to very many forces against the kind of policies he had uh, incidentally took, or, took over pa Pakistan in a coup, Fazlur Rahman, in, during this time, Fazlur Rahman was, posed, was exposed to public vilification. The specific trigger came in, when his book, first published in 1965 in English, called Islam, was translated into Urdu. Rahman's ideas, idea of revelation discussed in this book exposed him to theological criticism, particularly in the public. Because of that, he was forced to resign, and he eventually left the country. He took up a post as a professor of Islamic studies at Chicago University, where he worked with students from the United States, but also from students coming from the Muslim world. Some of these students, particularly from Turkey and Indonesia, have taken up his ideas and spread them, spread them among Muslim intellectuals. It's very particularly influential in Indonesia and Turkey. To a certain extent, in the last few years, he's also been, begun to be read by Arab scholars like Nasser Abu Zaid and Ali Mabrouk. Rahman, Rahman wrote many, many articles and books through his career, but some of these really stand out, which I would like to uh, point them out to you. I will list each of them in chronological order and describe them briefly. Later, I will come back to them to show they were part of a project to restate revelation for modern societies. So beginning with his uh, PhD dissertation, it was devoted to a study of Ibn Sina's understanding of prophecy. Ibn Sina presented a thesis that the prophet was a highly developed and gifted philosopher who had the ability to make philosophical truths accessible to the masses through symbols and narratives. So this is a book that was first, a book that he published in 1958, and then his thesis, I've seen a, a, an edition of 1978. It might have been published before that as well. Through his study of Ibn Sina, Rahman remained indebted to the question of prophecy and its translatability in history. I hope we can see that later. Another milestone in his publication was a book entitled Islamic Methodology in History, published in 1965. As the name indicates, the book presented the method used by the early scholars to develop jurisprudence, sharia or fiqh. This is a book that takes on board modern historical criticism of hadith as developed by Golzi and Shah, which we heard about, if you still remember, on Monday. But Rahman, through this modern reading, Rahman tried to recover a method that predated the work of Shafi, where he, where he, which he called a living sunnah, uh, was used to arrive at values. Unlike his Western interlocutors, who believed that the hadith were completely in, in, invented, Rahman believed or argued that the idea of following the prophet, the prophetic model, was not invented by, by Shafi, but changed by him. Around the same time, Rahman published a book called Islam in 1965 that was translated into Urdu and got him into trouble, as I said. In this book and some of, some of his articles, Rahman proposed a theory of prophecy, which was inspired by his reading of Muslim philosophy and modern historical studies. Rahman argued for a more organic relationship between the context of Arabia, divine inspiration, and the personality of the prophet. This was a reworking, I believe, of Ibn Sina's theory of prophecy, bringing on board hermeneutical and historical ideas that he had developed from, modern, from his exposure to Western studies. In 1979-1980, Rahman wrote a book called, called Major Themes of the Quran. It was a thematic exegesis which had, been, which had been increasingly, this idea of a thematic exegesis was becoming increasingly popular among modern thinkers. So Rahman was not necessarily someone who invented it, but a thematic uh, approach to the Quranic uh, meanings was not necessarily promoted uh, somewhat in pre-modern pre times. So this new idea of thinking about the Quran exemplified the key values to be found in the Quran, which Rahman found quite useful and important in his, uh, in his project. Two other books were devoted to an understanding of Muslim history. One, one was devoted on hermeneutics and the second on reform. The first one, Islam and Modernity, was published in 1982, reviews the history of Muslim hermeneutics from the beginning of Islam to the present. 
The second book, uh, published posthumously and edited by our friend Ibrahim Musa with an extensive introduction, was devoted to a critical exercise of how Muslims have tried to revive the Islamic tradition, and but not always have not all, in, in, but in a way that that is not always approved by Fazlur Rahman. So in this last book, Rahman presented a critical review of the kind of a revival, not only intellectual, but also show, social and political that had happened, that had t taken place in the history, in the history of Islam. I thought it, I think it is a bit unfortunate that it was called fundamentalism as such, but I suppose that was the year 2000. So Rahman's work has been appreciated by many who have reflected on the challenges of Muslim societies. This includes the way, work of the Pakistani intellectual, uh, Professor Muhammad Khali Masood, in the field of Islamic law, who may be considered to be his immediate successor. Masood has developed further some of the key ideas of Rahman on the values that underpin jurisprudence, and particularly also their social construction over the centuries. Recently, I invited him to come and give a few lectures of his ideas. In Western academia, Rahman is invariably categorized as a modernist or adaptationist in the way suggested by Vol. I have found one review of Rahman's book by Shacht, which says that it offers nothing to the development of historical scholarship, but was rather preoccupied with the pragmatic purpose of persuading traditional scholarship that may be, adopt, that may be adopted in, in the new state or in the new Muslim societies. In my review of religious studies scholars working in Islam, I have found, no, no, I have found very little appreciation for his intellectual labor. Such concern is quite interesting given there was great interest in Muslim intellectuals of the past. I can keep that for comment for a bit later. Among Muslims, it would come as no surprise to, to find so polemics against Fazlur Rahman. The key part of their criticisms comes from the framework of Western scholarship on Islam. So the general view is that Rahman, like other modernists, or at least like others like him, can be called modernists, who, and who slavishly followed Western modernity. A prominent scholar in Pakistan, oh, sorry, and I've got it wrong again, <laughs> sorry. Okay, just listen to me then. Um, a prominent scholar in Pakistan who has become famous for his promotion of Islamic finance represents one such criticism of Rahman and others like him. His name is Mufti Taki Usmani, who's, and he's written a book called uh, Modernism. He calls it Jiddat Pasandi, which means those people who love the West. Who says, and it says that, Modernists like Rahman were busy dismantling the rules of Islam while doing nothing about exploiting the benefits that Western modernism had to offer Muslims. Muslims are, writing in 1999, he says that Muslims are deprived of the amenities and comforts that modern time has provided to humanity and the evils of modernism as a, are, are at liberty to prevail in our society with no check from our side. Rahman, as head of the research center in the 1960s, was singled out for this criticism in a book written in 1990s. Usmani, as a promoter of Islamic finance, had presumably a particular understanding of these benefits that he says were rejected by Rahman. For Rahman, the value of political and social justice, as I will show, were central, was central to his reading of the Quran and its necessity for Pakistan in the 1960s. Those who have looked more closely at his work have seen a faithfulness to, Rahman, to, to Fazlur Rahman in the tradition. So unlike Taki Usmani, people who have looked a little bit more closely at the work see that Rahman has still worked within the tradition. So I'd like to share a few idea, a few thoughts uh, uh, with you on those. Uh, Basit Koshur from Pakistan argues that Rahman emphasized the value of ijtihad. Uh, uh, as you may recall, this is independent reasoning in Islamic law for a particular historical context. According to Koshul, Rahman lamented the fact that ijtihad was not always followed in a systematic way in the past. It was abandoned too early and replaced with imitation. Secondly, according to Koshul, Rahman emphasized the value of history by transforming a strategy of interpretation in the, in the history of Islam called Azbab al-Nuzul, which means occasions of, of, of revelation. The term referred to an invis investigation of a historical event associated with a verse in the Quran or the prophetic tradition. So Muslim scholars in the past, in order to try to understand verses, they often try to look what was the particular 
uh, occasion of revelation. They ought, never, never quite like to call it cause because that would, would be putting, uh, putting revelation uh, below you know, social, political uh, events as such. So they often call it azbab nuzul which means an occasion of the revelation. So Koshu says that Rahman, and Rahman transformed this idea with, 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 an idea, with ideas of historicism that he gained from his study in Punj at the Punjab and in Oxford. So in the view of Koshul, Rahman was a traditional scholar rooted in traditional Islam who updated the apparatus of an established Islamic discourse of ijtihad. In a more extensive and fuller review of Rahman's work, Ibrahim Musa considered the many areas in which he made contributions, particularly in this long introduction that he wrote in, his, in the edited work published in 2000. Musa singles out his contribution in ethics and hermeneutics through, a the, through his theory of prophecy. Musa reads Rahman to be an, on an intellectual journey in which he left behind some ideas. Thus, he was interested in history, but chose Ibn Sina's commitment to metaphysics. But he left behind that as well, according to Musa, and held on to the value of history. Rahman, according to Musa, held fast to, and I quote, a normativism whereby history engages transcendent revelation in order to create a new consciousness and new values for the emerging age. But Musa concludes with a concern shared by most Muslims that, that, that in the presence of an ascendant West, and I quote again, a single dominant perspective of civilization is gradually overtaking our contemporary world, driven by globalizing and homogenizing cultural technological, scientific, and humanistic forces, end of quote. I'm wondering if Musa was unconsciously or maybe has consciously feeling that about Rahman as well. Did Rahman, according to Musa, give up too much to this new world? I'd like to present something from my, a little bit from my own work, and this is this last point here. In my book that I published in 2009, 2010, called Religion in Modern Islamic Discourse, I have added my voice to this reception and analysis of Fazlur Rahman. There I suggested that one should re-examine the tendency to think about Muslim intellectuals as reactionary responses to challenges coming from the West. While this reactionary mode cannot be completely denied, such an analysis does not allow us to see the development of a new religious discourse or an, or a, or an adding a new dimension to this intellectual tradition. I undertook a close reading of the intellectuals from the 19th century and followed their ideas and that of their successes in the 20th century in this book, I'm meaning. Given my interest in religious studies, I was amazed to see how many of them attempted to redefine Islam as a religion. Using this cue, I proposed a rereading of the modern Muslim intellectual corpus, paying close attention to their preoccupation with religion. I found them discussing the questions of the essence of religion, the function of religion, and its meaning, the, main, the meaning of religion for state identity and authenticity, and also gender. In each case, I found that they try, they, by using these new ideas of religion, they were subtly but very clearly bringing about new ideas in the thinking of Islam for, the, for, for, a, for a new modern discourse, but broadly also for the society as well. I did not think about it at the time, this was, this was an attempt to identify an intellectual discourse that ran parallel to and often counter to a Western hegemonic discourse, particularly in the study of religions. Recently, I have begun to think about its decolonial implications in the atmosphere of the time, I wanted to say. Within this tradition, Rahman inherits a line of thinking that, that began in India, I found, what Sayyid Ahmad Khan, in the 19th century. Sayyid Ahmad Khan stands out for his realization that the new sciences coming with the colonizers demanded a new foundation and a new defense of religion. So he developed, he is one of the very earliest scholars in the, in the very early part of you know, the second half of the 19th century who begins to say that what we really need in Islam is a new theology in order to defend Islam. So very interesting to see how he picks up this idea that theology is meant for the defense of Islam, as we saw from Ghazali, but he realized that the, that old theology will not work when you're thinking about these new sciences. 
This Indian tradition was continued by a poet and philosopher, Muhammad Iqbal, who believed that the reconstruction of Islam was needed for a new meaning of religion. Iqbal was in turn much more looking at ideas come in, in, coming to him, particularly from the, um, not so much from the Enlightenment like Khan was, but from the, um, what is the 19th century, this new movement, sorry, some of you know your philosophy. It's a very major movement, um, the, 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 the 19th century philosophy, philosophical movement that very much kind of an anti-enlightenment tradition. Anyway, the word will come to me just now. It's a very popular word, but just right now it's missing me and I didn't write it. Okay. Rahman was aware of both Khan and Iqbal's contributions and built his ideas on them and developed his ideas. He's written a few com book articles on, on commenting on the romanticism. That's what I was thinking about, the, the romantic traditions that, uh, that uh, um, uh, Khan, uh, um, uh, Iqbal was very much influenced by. Sorry for that. With these lectures, I realized that my pendulum swung too far on the one side. I mean, I'm realizing now through these lectures that what I was doing in the book, I was doing too, in, in some way, I was doing a little bit too much. I went too far to the innovative and creative side of Rahman and others at the expense of ignoring their longer intellectual roots. So in my presentation of Rahman today, I would like to share my earlier insights with some reflections on how he transformed these earlier traditions in a way suggested by Koshul. But I think Rahman's indebtedness to medieval Islamic philosophy was more important than his rework reworking of Islamic legal strategies and mechanisms like Ijtihad and Asbab al nuzul His solution on how to access revelation was much more indebted to Ibn Sina's idea of prophecy and by extension to how earlier Muslim intellectuals contributed to that question that I present to you today. So, Rahman has written, has written some of the most insightful work, I think, in the modern world on how Muslims can recover a moral vision and purpose. He called for a critical reading of the Islamic legacy. The key words in his books are revelation, values, history, and hermeneutics. And I'd like to unpack those ideas through the books that he has written, which I've mentioned to you. So Rahman's conceptualization of religion can be found in his, in his rejection of secularism in a clear and unequivocal way. So this comes from my book, obviously, because this is what I was looking for, how they thought about religion. So for Rahman, I thought his emphasis an emphatic rejection of secularism. This rejection provides an entry point for his understanding of the essence of religion as a moral imperative. Rahman, Rahman asserted, and I quote, that secularism is necessarily atheistic, end of quote, since, and I quote again, it destroys the sanctity and the universality of all moral values, end of quote. He was alarmed at secularism's corrosive effect on the capacity to found a society, nation, and civilization. And I quote him again, secularism must cut at the roots of Islam in both ways, but by destroying the possibilities of the unity of the Muslim community, the Ummah, externally, and by relegating Islam internally to the position of a private creed and ritual as being something merely between a man's heart and his God, as a secularist cliche has it, end of quote. Rahman concedes that secularism in the West, oh, sorry, I should have given you that. You can see that secularism in the West worked to some extent in close cooperation with Christianity and its values. So he sort of thought that somehow in the West, secularism did not, have absolute, uh, did not completely lose its values. However, he argued that the models of secularism promoted in the Muslim world, first by the colonizers and, that by, and then by post-colonial rulers, made no provision for values, or at least abandoned values. In the context of Muslim studies, uh, it was only the modernists who insisted on the creative application of values in society. Traditionalists were merely concerned with, and to quote him again, creed and ritual. By focusing on values then, Rahman's modernism rejected a secular approach that promoted the privatization of religion. This is how he sort of connected what he took from secularism and rejected was this privatization. So Rahman was committed to finding these moral values in a systematic and critical reading of revelation. And this bring, brings us to the question posed by Shafi and his successes that I've presented to you. Like them, Rahman embraced the value of revelation, meaning the idea of revelation. 
and the necessity, but also the necessity for a new framework and a new access to that revelation. When I wrote my book, I was belaboring under a common assumption that this consciousness was, was special to modernity. And I, I have hopefully shown you, shown you how premature that impression of mine was. Nevertheless, I will read Rahman's work as a response to this question, which I, and, and then show his discontinuity more clearly with his predecessors. I begin with Rahman's overview of the philosophical uh, project of medieval Islam that appeared in his book in 1958. This quote shows his criticism of that tradition, but also indicates the answer to the question posed by, 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 by the philosophers and also the mystics and other Muslim intellectuals in the past. So Rahman says, according to the philosophers, the goal of man consists in contemplation of reality. In their thoroughly, as you can see, intellectualist, mystical attitude to life. The life of religious moral action is at best a ladder which is to be transcended. The orthodox impulse is activist. It does not reject intellectualism, but subordinates it to the end of moral dynamism. Unlike the philosophers, Rahman recognized a moral dynamism in the leading intellectuals of what he calls, actually interestingly, orthodoxy. But then in his other work, he argued that this moral dynamism was repeatedly undermined by the representatives of the orthodox, sometimes through a rigid approach to text, and at other times through wild mystical and philosophical speculations. We can recognize the criticism of Shafi'i and Ghazali in this, in this particular characterization of that discipline. So Rahman said that, they were, that the orthodoxy of Islam is moral dynamism, but it was actually uh, ignored by the intellect philosophers, but, but actually misplaced by the, by the orthodox, orthodox, orthodox representatives. Rahman found a moral purpose and dynamism directly in the life of the Prophet Muhammad and in the Quran, which were intimately connected with each other in his view. The Quran exuded key values and the Prophet enacted them and lived them. This sounds, you must, you must, probably, you must say, as traditional as it comes. But one has to look closer at his work to recognize a new, a new answer to an old framework. So, what is it, with regard to the Qur'an therefore, what, is, what, what do we mean, what does the Rahman be no revelation, what is his understanding of revelation, and how do you access this? This is my perennial question that I've been coming back to. So with regard to the Qur'an, Rahman offers a hermeneutic that leads to the discovery of moral imperatives. His major themes in the Qur'an, the book called Major Themes in the Qur'an, enumerates these values in a very careful and a systematic way. He was aware of criticism that may be leveled against his reading of the Qur'an. Particularly, he was aware of the reputation that the German philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer enjoyed in philosophical and religious circles during this time. He writes about Gadamer, but he rejects him. Rahman explicitly rejected Gadamer's in, the, the Gadamerian implication of historical readings as hopelessly subjective. Against Gadamer, he followed a reading of text that believed in the capacity of the mind to grasp its meaning and also to change the world. Both understanding and transformation were included in Rahman's hermeneutic. According to Rahman, however, the text could not be read outside history. So he didn't take a complete idealist position. For understanding the Quran, one had to begin with the important events in history that led to the social and political transformation of Arabia. And in that history, one had to appreciate the work done by the Prophet Muhammad. It is not an accident that his book Islam begins with a chapter on Muhammad and not with a chapter on God. Rahman argued that the life of the Prophet Muhammad was closely connected with his time on the one hand and with revelation on the other. For Rahman, the Quran was a divine word uttered through the mind and heart and tongue of the Prophet. Against, this is obviously, this, this is this, uh, against popular criticism of this position, which was seen to be, to be heretical in Pakistan in the 1960s, Rahman responded that his views were well represented in some earlier Muslim philosophical and particularly Sufi understandings of revelation. Interestingly, Rahman did not have much time for Sufism, but he, he, he looked for them for support for his ideas. This was a nice line of defense. 
as Sufis were more acceptable to Pakistani Muslims. But the main ideas for Rahman, I believe, come from his reading of Ibn Sina. It was the philosophers in medieval Islam who, promoted, who proposed a naturalistic understanding of prophecy, which suited Rahman's case. This is a subject on which Rahman devoted much attention from his PhD all the way to many of his articles and his book, Prophecy in Islam. It offered material on how to conceptualize a theological doctrine with a philosophical project that was reflected particularly in politics and in society. I have mentioned this philosophical politics briefly in my discussion of Al-Mawardi. Rahman reformulated these ideas for a post-colonial political project. And obviously with different values, but certainly it is, it is noticeable, I hope you can see. With the text of the Quran and its context, read through the personality of the Prophet, Rahman focused on what he called its key values. He, and these values he enumerated, belief in God, socio-economic justice, and belief in the afterlife, meaning accountability. From this experience, Islam, for, according to Rahman, offered two valuable princip principles for the modern world, individual conscience and a balanced community for humankind. Balanced community of justice, maybe I should add. In Islam in Modernity, the book that he published in 1982, he states that these were the key elements in the original, and I quote again, in the original experience of Muhammad, name of God. So we have a book that must be read for values, meaning the Quran, whilst paying close attention to a context in which the Prophet was intimately engaged. This hermeneutical movement of understanding the early Muslim community set the ground for, for, according to Fazlur Rahman, for another equally important second movement. A Muslim living in another context, in a context other than the prophetic one, should also immerse, should immerse himself or herself in that context and recognize its radically different nature from the original society. Without understanding the moral demands of the new context, according to Fazlur Rahman, there was no way to appreciate the application of the moral values of the first society. So if I could quote, just bring out that quote here. This is Rahman's quote for this hermeneutical movement. Just as those generations met their own situation adequately by freely, it's my emphasis, freely interpreting the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet, by emphasizing the ideal and the principles and re-embodying them in a fresh texture of their own contemporary history, we must perform the same feat ourselves with our own effort for our own contemporary history. There was much work to be done but I believe Azul Rahman presented a model of Islam as values, or model of revelation as values that could be transported, that could be translated from one context to another. His work called Islamic Methodology in History may be read as an exemplification of how this double hermeneutical movement took place in the early history of Islam. Again, like his view on prophecy, his views on hadith and sinna and, and Sunnah got, got him into trouble among, with many Muslims, in, particularly in Pakistan. But the significance of his book was lost on whether he thought that the Hadith were actually uh, uh, authentic or not. It showed how after the death of the Prophet, his book is itself, I'm meaning, after the death of the Prophet, the early Muslims engaged with revelation not in a way suggested by Shafi. The Sunnah represented the normative force, according to Rahman, of the Prophet's authority, not its particular rules. Unlike the Hadith as texts, the Sunnah of the Prophet included the values of the Prophet and their creative application and elaboration. In the period immediately after the Prophet, this model was translated in what Fazlur Rahman called a living Sunnah, in terms of the new materials and with the new needs. All of these are quotation. In terms of the new materials and with new needs, Rahman says, that faced the earliest Muslim. So Rahman said that while hadith may not be trusted, one could not ignore what the Muslims did with the Quran and the experiences of the Prophet Muhammad together with his authority. They produced a living sunnah, not another set of texts that should be replaced alongside the Quran as Shafi'i did. I hope that in conclusion then of what I've been, trained, uh, what I've been saying uh, with regard to uh, Fazal Rahman and also I want to use the opportunity to draw some conclusions of my lectures as well. 
I hope that I've been able to convey a, a difficult, the difficult task that I set for myself today, to try and convey to you some idea of, of the I, idea of a kind of a modern Islamic project by focusing on Fazl rahman In education, Rahman was exposed to two very different types of modern education. The first was his father's training in Deobandi thought, and the second at the Punjab and Oxford University. You may notice I'm calling Deoban modern as well, because Deoban is considered to be the quintessential traditional education, but it was founded in 1867 after the, uh, after the uh, colonized, complete colonization of India. Calling him a modernist, calling Fazlur Rahman modernist, whether that comes from Western scholars or his Muslim opponents, does not begin to identify his contribution. I've tried to present to you how he has developed a different approach to revelation, given a new political context in which the West is ascendant and which, and which Muslims were first defeated and then found themselves with the responsibility to build independent states after independence. In this context, Rahman undertook, undertook a review of the Quran, Sunnah, and the intellectual legacy. He offered a new model for thinking about the legacy by emphasizing the importance of values or by focusing on, the, on values very very particularly the values of, of conscience and social justice. In order to justify this model, he offered an innovative reading of history and texts. Moreover, he also offered a rereading of the philosophical ideas of prophecy. I've prevented this lecture in a very self-conscious way, self way to show how Rahman's work may be inserted in the longer discourse that I have been presenting this week. So let me conclude my talk by turning to some of those long durée questions. Firstly, I want to return to the idea of rapture, falta, with which I approached the death of the Prophet and what that meant to the second Khalif Omar. I have suggested that we extend that singular event to repeated experiences. These, are new, these were new experiences, but also unexpected experiences that alerted Muslims to seek or provide or gave them the opportunity to seek new answers. I hope that the death of the Prophet, the emergence of an empire, the weakening of the empire, the new sources of knowledge, the challenge of reason and rationalism, the opportunity for spiritual enlightenment, and the colonial destruction of a world are, are worthy of being described as falta, as falatat in which I inserted these intellectual encounters. Secondly, I suggested that such events force or provide an opportunity to reconstruct the meaning of revelation. I narrowed this down to the question of how Muslims promised access to revelation when the prophetic event had passed. I do not see this as a necessar necessarily a weakening of access to revelation, but a highly creative event, even if often controversial, about, about who has access to that revelation and how. I can only enumerate those that I have highlighted, the linguistic system of texts, the plurality of sources from which one has to make a take a decision, the kashf, the disclosure, uh, divine disclosure, or at least the privileged divine disclosure of al Ghazali, the birthing of spiritual awakening in Rumi, and the moral vision of Rahman. One might also want to consider the moral and ethical costs and benefits from these engagements. This was clear in Shafi'i, who weighed the cost of justice against unity and conformity. The value of deliberating plural, plurality in al-Mawardi against singular political projects in those who, who, who took a different view. The ethical project of the self that Ghazali put in the service of divine disclosure the sources of spiritual awareness that Rumi pointed to, the self, uh, pointed to for the self everywhere, and the social and political values of Rahman against the mystical and philosophical values for self. Finally, I hope that I conveyed to you the sense of a discourse that these Muslim intellectuals were engaging in through this time. The methods that they have employed from language to rationality to hermeneutics seems to be worthy of specific appreciation, engagement, and further examination. I've also used and pointed to the intellectual discourse of modernity that has cast its critical eye on, that, on this tradition. I have benefited uh, significantly from this Western, what I would call Western intellectual tradition, but I've often found that it fails to appreciate the intellectual labor of those to whom it has subjected to study. That I hope that I have in contrast, sufficiently brought to life 
this discourse that remains fairly dormant still in that tradition. I thank you, last but not least, for being an inspiring audience. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you know, all this sort of, you know, what we in the West see as destructive mm -hmm. forces mm -hmm. and power growth in the Middle East, is, is there a sort of countering intellectual tradition, or is it just sort of reactionary without really having any sort of intellectual basis? Yeah, okay. That's, uh, that's a long question. That's a big question. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say both. It is a reaction. It is a very strong reaction against so, so many things. I think probably most importantly, it is a reaction against what, um, what the West does in the Middle East. So I think that's something that one often tends to ignore, um, especially when one looks at what has happened over the last 20 or 30 years. There has been such a destruction of the societies, and therefore people are turning to a very uh, kind of authenticity and authentic self as such with which they find either in this Diobandi tradition which I spoke about, which promises them kind of a, 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 a that you, you, all you can do is benefit from the West, but you don't necessarily need to really engage with what it has to do. But you also don't need to engage with your own tradition. That's the one, that's probably the majority that does that. On the other hand, oh, during the last, since the, the emergence of particularly the uh, the, uh, the, the, the war against, uh, starting with the war against Iran and then against Iraq and then uh, Libya and all of these countries as such, the amount of, the, the, the level of destruction that has, that, has, that has been visited on these societies forced, has forced people to actually turn to an intellectual tradition and that is, an, that is on the one hand, is a political movement of destruction, like you know, but it is also, a, it is also drawing on intellectual tradition that actually belongs to the past. So this is the people, people of Qaeda, for example, know how to read people like Abu Ya'ala al-Farra, al the person that I uh, quoted you know, against al-Mawardi, or perhaps al-Shafi, or these political ideas. So they want to recover the whole political project. So that is what, what is actually coming. So I would, I would think that they, that intellectual tradition, it is an intellectual tradition, but there's also a very strong reactionary political movement as such. But one should also say that they, it is also invoked, it is, there's also an element of, a, of, a, of an extreme self-destruction in that as well. So unlike the past, which was, which was really clear meditated to found empires, I know I may be summarizing so, a couple of my articles that I've written, so I'm, hopefully it's still clear to you. But what you do, with, what you, when you look at their work and you look at what, what they put up you know, in, in the idea, in the, establishment, in the establishment of the caliphate is not necessarily to establish a caliphate. It's, it is to establish the end of the world. So one of the most popular citations of the Islamic caliphate was actually the fact that they are going to usher in the end of time. And the end of time is going to lead to an Armageddon, and they were, going to, they were, they were actually getting the pe people ready for that an Armageddon. So, I, I try to answer your difficult question, but I ho hope that that gives you some idea of where that that that, that idea comes, where those ideas come from. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, Ali. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting. <laughs> 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 
become a good Rahmanian before Rahman. <laughs> okay. So, so the question was whether, I mean, I think Ali, you were given up a long excursus on a theological question that Muslims have about what is the difference between the Quran and the Hadith? How do we sort of reconcile these? Isn't there, uh, shouldn't there be, uh, the question is, you know, um, he's coming from the position against the kind of a more, what I would call, um, you know, usual position or traditional position that uh, on the one hand makes a distinction between the Quran and the Hadith, but then also uh, in practice doesn't actually w do that, you know. So his, uh, his, his comment was, you know, this question about that, that the Khalif should be from, of, the, of the Quraysh, that appears in a Hadith, in a Hadith text. And so therefore, you know, what we read from, what we heard from a Shafi, so that's something that you cannot necessarily just do away with. And so what you, are, what you get with sort of modern readings like Rahman is to say, no, we will focus on the values, and so therefore we can use the values in order to judge the text, the, the text of the Hadith. So Muslims are much more open to accepting the authenticity of revelation in the Quran, but not the authenticity of revelation you know, and they don't call it revelation in the actions of the Prophet Muhammad. So I think these two, these questions will, will, will sort of have, will continue to, you know, probably as long as Muslims are Muslims and they believe in the Quran and the Prophet, there's, there's always going to be a way of where do you draw exactly the line. My sense of it is that I hope that what, uh, what I've uh, presented to you today is perhaps one should begin to think about the historical nature of these, of these decisions and of these uh, so one does, shouldn't do a kind of a ahistorical understanding of these texts, you know, to say where, what were these uh, verses from the Quran, or at least what were the hadith texts as such. Generally, a lot of the work that is done on this is done, and then say, well, you cannot accept the hadith because, well, at this point in time, you don't like that value, right? I mean, it might be that you don't like that value, but you have to ground it in a much more organized way of thinking. So I think that Rahman presents us with some example. I'm, I'm sure, I, I, I'm sure them, you know, not all of us might agree with him, but at least it is, it is a systematic way of doing so and thinking about that. And maybe we should wait for something from you as well, and then we'll talk about you in a few years' time. But I think that that's, that's really what you presented is the, is the important dilemma. What I, what I think is interesting is that by looking at Shafi's you know, ex particular experience and how he by beginning to not only focus on his deliberation on hadith, but also his linguistic system, perhaps we can begin to see this, this tradition differently. Because at the moment, what is happening is that people are always fighting each other with respect to which, who's got the text. Do you have the right text, or it's my text, is that text? And not necessarily taking the debate one step further. So I hope that, you yeah. know. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Yes, you were worried about whether you should, we would be able to follow my lectures. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Johnson.